from Microbe TV. This is Infectious Disease Puscast, Episode 7, recorded on July 20th, 2022. I'm Daniel Griffin, and joining me today is Sarah Dog. Hello, everyone. All right. Welcome to another Puscast. References, as always, are available in our show notes at microbe.tv, the home of our multimedia empire. Puscast is a review of the infectious disease literature for the last two weeks that we found interesting or entertaining. Now, on to the literature, shall we? All right. Well, apparently people really like the way you pronounce literature. (laughs) Um, So we will start with viral. I like to remind everyone, listen to the TWIV, This Week in Virology, clinical updates for COVID and some monkeypox-related information. But let's go right into it. The rapid communication, frequent detection of monkeypox virus DNA in saliva, semen, and other clinical samples from 12 patients, Barcelona, Spain, May to June 2022. This was published in Eurosurveillance. In this investigation, upon MPX laboratory confirmation, that's the monkeypox, 17 patients were invited to participate in this study, which included collection of saliva, rectal swabs, nasopharyngeal swabs, semen, urine, and fecal samples. 12 people agreed to do that. Clinical samples, saliva, rectal, and nasopharyngeal swab, semen, urine, and fecal samples were inactivated with a one-to-one volume of Cobus omnilysis reagent. That's critical because we do not have any active virus. This is all just inactivated. Um, This inactivation was done prior to the nucleic acid extraction in an automated system. So no viral culture, just DNA detection, high RNA copy numbers. They say viral loads, but I think we all know better. CQ values less than or equal to 21. That's quantification cycle. Apparently that is the politically correct way to refer to CT values. These were observed in some saliva, rectal swab, semen, urine, and fecal samples. Intermittent shedding, so negative PCR results that became positive in the following time point uh, collected were also observed in samples such as urine and saliva. So a negative and then a positive. MPX viral RNA was detected in saliva from all 12 patients studied. And in some cases, a low CQ value indicative of high DNA copy numbers. In addition, the other clinical samples tested were frequently positive for MPX viral DNA, rectal swab, 11 out of 12, nasopharyngeal, 10 out of 12, semen, 7 out of 9, urine, 9 out of 12. There goes that urine is sterile idea. And feces, 8 out of 12. Now, I have to say, early on, a few weeks ago, and we've only been, what, May 17th when this saga started here in the States, there was a gentleman who ended up, not sure what he was doing, but ended up with a bit of semen in his eye over the weekend, Um, did not qualify for testing because that's not the way you get the monkeypox. Uh, Vesicles developed probably about 10 days later. Finally, the audition turned positive. We were allowed to test him, and that semen in the eye story, he had the monkeypox. That's hard to follow. (laughs) In OFID, there was an article entitled The Impact of Churn on HIV Outcomes in the Southern United States, sorry, a Southern United States Clinical Cohort. Um, So if you have not heard this term before, churn, C-H-U-R-N, is referring to the cycle of engaging and disengaging in care that persons with HIV may experience, which in this study was defined as a 12 or more month gap between routine clinic visits or viral load measurements. So this retrospective cohort study took a look at persons establishing care at a center in Atlanta. They found that 15% of the about 1,300 persons living with HIV newly establishing care experienced churn in the median follow-up time, which was about three years. And importantly, those who experienced churn had higher rates of transmissible viremia, so 29% pre-churn to 66% post-churn. And these patients returning to care contributed disproportionately to the community viral load. Um, So this is an interesting study taking a look specifically at the prevalence and effect of churn in the South, specifically Atlanta, which has the second highest rate of new infections in a metro area in the U.S. Um, I think another key here is that younger black uh, People living with HIV or those with a history of substance use disorder comprise a larger proportion of those with churn, um, which I think is just 
uh, indication of our structural disparities that exist here in the states, like institutional racism and socioeconomic barriers and discrimination. Um, I think it's important to note that there was an absence and in increased future deviations to care, meaning that we really just need to reinforce the value of investing and in helping these patients return to care because they can have a sustained period of retention. All right. So moving, moving away to a quick PSA, the official CDC health advisory recent reports of human parecho virus. Apparently, I'm supposed to say a little bit of a Southern accent there, or maybe a Spanish accent. In the United States 2022, since May 2022, CDC has received reports from healthcare providers in multiple states of PEV infections in neonates and young infants. Parecho viruses are a group of viruses known to cause a spectrum of disease in humans. Clinicians are encouraged to include... PEV and the differential diagnosis of infants presenting with fever, sepsis-like syndrome, or neurological illness, seizures, meningitis. Just a little background, symptoms such as upper respiratory tract infection, fever, and rash are common in children between six months and five years, with most children having been infected with this virus by the time they start kindergarten. However, in infants less than three months, severe illness can occur including sepsis-like illness, seizures, meningitis, or meningoencephalitis, particularly in infants younger than one month. No specific treatment for PEV. However, diagnosing PEV in infants may change clinical management and provide important health information for families. All right. In a study from the International Journal of Infectious Diseases, cytomegalovirus viremia as risk factor for mortality and HIV-associated cryptococcal and tuberculous meningitis. So authors here found that CMV DNAemia at baseline was associated with a higher risk of death at 18 weeks in about 300 persons with HIV and cryptococcal meningitis, and then about 13 persons with HIV and TB meningitis. Um, the risk of mortality also increased as the CMV viral load increased. Um, you know, I I feel like concurrent CMV viremia is never a good prognostic sign, and I think of it in many ways as a marker of your immune system. Uh, the median CD4 count in the viremic group, by the way, was 14. Um, I am not sure that there's something different that I am going to do with this study right now, and what it doesn't really answer is whether we can do anything about it and whether prophylactic or preemptive CMV therapy would make a difference. And it seems like that is kind of their next step or plan is to trial assessing if anti-CMV therapy in persons with HIV and meningitis would be a modifiable risk factor, potentially in a probably a small subpopulation of those who have advanced disease. All right. The BMJ news item, Ghana declares its first outbreak of Marburg virus disease after two deaths. Ghana has announced the country's first outbreak of Marburg virus disease, the highly infectious disease caused by a virus from the same family as Ebola, another one of our hemorrhagic viruses. Samples from a 26-year-old man and 51-year-old man who were reported death on the 27th, dead on the 27th of June and 28th of June, respectively, uh, were confirmed at a World Health Organization collaborating cent center laboratory. The two men were not related. So more to, more to follow on that. All right. And wrapping up this section in the New England Journal, the case series of children with acute hepatitis and human adenovirus was published. So this takes a look at nine children at Children's of Alabama with acute hepatitis of unknown cause that we've talked about in a couple episodes. Eight of these children had positive adenovirus testing. And similar to what we learned about in the prior publications and what we talked about in the last episodes, the liver biopsies did not show evidence of adenovirus on immunohistochemical or electron microscopy exam. There was PCR testing from liver tissue that was positive in three of the six children with active hepatitis on liver biopsy. That said, you can't totally know whether that may have been some contamination from viremic blood during the biopsy. They did do sequencing from five children and showed three distinct adenovirus type 41 variants. So even if adenovirus was determined to be A or the culprit, it was not an outbreak driven by a single strain. So not really, I wasn't sure where to put this one. I put it in viral because of adenovirus, but I think 
um, this is pretty similar to what we've learned along the way. All right. And moving on to bacterial. Do I have some dislike for vancomycin? Is there a pattern here? The article, Pharmacokinetic Variability of Vancomycin in Patients with the Nosocomial Meningitis, was published in the Journal of Clinical Pharmacy and Therapeutics. I always love to ask the medical students and residents, why do we add vancomycin to our treatment for meningitis? Are we worried about MRSA meningitis? I remind them that just like cereal, vancomycin is not just for MRSA. The addition of vancomycin was implemented in 1997 to provide coverage for ceftriaxone non-susceptible, ceftriaxone or cefotaxime MIC concentration greater than or equal to one microgram per milliliter strep pneumonia isolates that were associated with ceftriaxone treatment failures. Um, we do want to get high doses into the CSF if we are really going to have much of an impact here. And this study suggested that the clinical condition and inflammatory response of a patient with meningitis influences the pharmacokinetics of vancomycin. The authors suggest, and I will agree, that the vancomycin dosage for the treatment of nosocomial bacterial meningitis must be adjusted according to the changes in the clinical condition and renal function of the patient necessitating careful therapeutic drug monitoring. I will comment one of the hospitals that I started to frequent, they looked at the ability of the ID docs who are managing vancomycin to get that vancomycin to the goal trough following the 2007 guidance. We were doing it, they were doing it about 12% of the time. So you got to do better. <laughs> well, speaking of vancomycin... <laughs> Intensive care medicine uh, article was published, Association of Vancomycin plus Piperacillin Tazobactam with Early Changes in Creatinine for Cystatin C in Critically Ill Adults, a Prospective Cohort Study. Uh, so this included patients in the MESI cohort, which is a great acronym, Molecular Epidemiology of Sepsis, so two S's in the ICU, um, who were treated with 48 or more hours of Vanc and Piperacillin. Tazo or Vank and Cefepime. And then they looked at kidney function biomarkers, so creatinine, cystatin C, and BUN, pre antibiotics, and day two after antibiotics. So those in the Vank Piptazo group had a higher percentage increase in creatinine, but that was not associated with a change in cystatin C or clinical outcomes of dialysis or mortality. And they did do a couple uh, sensitivity analyses. Uh, more, majority of the excess what was creatinine defined acute kidney injury occurred early after antibiotic initiation, which could be consistent with rapid effects on creatinine tubular secretion. Um, all this being said, there was only a cystatin C in about a quarter of the patients, and it only really measured the change at day two. So I feel like we're just getting a small, quick glimpse here. Um, but I know even as a non-nephrologist that serum creatinine is an imperfect marker of GFR. So the question is still out there, is Vank, Piptazo, and renal injury maybe not as bad as we think? Well, I hope you're not encouraging people to continue with <laughs> Vanco and Zosin based on such a messy study. Now let us move forward. The article, Comparison of Sequential Dalbavancin to Standard of Care Treatment for Staphylococcus aureus back bloodstream infections was published in Open Forum Infectious Disease. Now, what is this dalbavancin? It is a long-acting lipoglycopeptide with activity against Staph aureus, including methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, MRSA, MRSA. This study investigated dal as sequential therapy in Staph aureus bloodstream infections 225 patients were included. As the authors tell us, previous studies have demonstrated that a two-dose series of 1,500 milligrams on day one and 1,500 milligrams on day eight are sufficient to maintain drug concentrations above the MIC for staph aureus for eight weeks. Uh, now, I will comment, this is a retrospective cohort study, so has um, you know, all those, those major limitations that we talk about. But the median length of stay was 16 days among the DAO recipients compared to 27 days among the standard of care. Central catheter placement was 17.8% compared to 57.2. Makes sense. 90-day clinical failure occurred in 13.3 and 18.3 of the DAO and the standard of care groups respectively. So not inferior, much easier. 
All right. In Lancet ID, there was a paper, Outbreak of Sexually Transmitted Extensively Drug-Resistant Shigella in the UK, 2021-22, to a descriptive epidemiologic study. And so I picked this just as a reminder that shigellosis is not just associated with travel to endemic regions or contaminated food, but it is increasingly associated with sexual transmission. So sexually transmitted shigellosis is endemic among men who have sex with men. And this study characterized the expansion specifically of an extensively drug resistant strain that is being transmitted among MSM in UK, Europe, and the US. Um, so this has a plasmid encoded ESBL gene resistant, um, leading to resistance to some of the usual first line therapy like Cipro. Um, so they talked about about 70 cases in the UK in this time period. I think what was interesting is that it really pointed out a potential shift in the epidemiology of sexually transmitted shigellosis with most cases being in HIV negative MSM utilizing PrEP in contrast to networks of individuals living with HIV. All right, and I'm going to change gears here. I'm going to open with ice cream, you scream. We all scream for ice cream in CID. Listeria illness and deaths associated with ongoing contamination of a multi-regional brand of ice cream products, U.S. 2010 to 2015. Um, so this detailed an outbreak associated listeriosis identified using whole genome sequencing, product testing results, and some epidemiologic linkage of cases. So there were 10 illnesses involving three deaths over a about five-year period. And so it was ultimately tied back to two production facilities with longstanding contamination. And so this was interesting because it specifically was in frozen dairy products, so like milkshakes, ice cream. Whereas we often think of listeria outbreaks as dairy, but in the sort of soft cheese milk. Um, so this is really the first one linking to ice cream. So if I was funnier, I could probably also do a pun with ice cream flavors, but I wasn't wasn't good enough to make one. <laughs> yeah, I was I was working. I, I couldn't do it either. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I enjoyed the article, Antibiotics for Preventing Recurrent Urinary Tract Infection, a Systemic Review and Meta-Analysis Published in Open Forum Infectious Disease. Now, the authors conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis, that's when you pile them high, of randomized controlled trials published up to the 13th of October 2020, evaluating patients greater than or equal to 12 years with either greater than or two episodes of lower UTI within six months or greater than or equal to three in the past year. Uh, placebo or antibiotics were allowed as the competitors. All right, lay your bets. In the 11 placebo controlled trials, the risk for developing UTI was 85% lower with prophylaxis compared to placebo. That's a relative risk of 0.15, 95% confidence interval 0.08 to 0.29. In the nine head-to-head -head trials, efficacy of antibiotic agents appeared similar. The pooled RR indicated no difference between nitrofrantoin and competitors. Relative risk 1.01 nor trimethoprin with or without sulfa methoxol, or nor floxacin and competitors. Studies comparing intermittent post-coil to continuous strategies revealed intermittent application as equally effective. Hmm. So I have a crazy case that was published in CID that I thought was fascinating. Uh, congenital tuberculosis after in vitro fertilization, a case for TB screening of women evaluated for infertility. And so they described an infant conceived with in vitro fertilization who had congenital TB and her mother with genitourinary TB. And then they, the authors took a look at other infant mother pairs with IVF associated congenital TB in the literature. Um, and so just to give a glimpse into this case, it was a 29 and six week infant who developed respiratory symptoms with a radiographic low bar pneumonia and hypoxia at about a month of life. She had a little bit of improvement with 10 days of empiric antibiotics, but had a persistent oxygen requirement. And then later on, around three months of life, had worsening pneumonia, ultimately was intubated and found to have MTB and BAL, lung biopsy, and gastric aspirate samples. The infant's mom was born in India, treated for TB as a child, but had infertility later in life. And so after baby was diagnosed, further evaluation of her endometritis led to endometrial cultures with 
MDR, MTB. Um, and so there were 22 cases of congenital TB after IVF that were reported. Um, so a consideration for patients with infertility that may have lived in a TB endemic area in the past. And certainly most mothers with infertility are not having any sort of active TB screening approach, at least in the U.S. So a really interesting case that ultimately had a good outcome for mom and baby. And then this is our next one is quite quick. Uh, in the Journal of Clinical Microbiology, there was a mini review of enhancing diagnostics and orthopedic infections. So I thought this was a really great summary of the micro techniques to keep in mind, as well as some of the other tests that are used related to detection of the host response in the setting of orthopedic infections. For example, I bet some of you have local orthopedic surgeons who use alpha defensin as a biomarker for PGI. So if you're wondering what that is, you can check out the paper. Um, so I think this is a nice resource in particular to give to learners on your team, but also for ourselves to refresh. Okay. So I loved this next letter. I may say that several times, but the letter to the editor of CID just published was great. Um, so if you are one of those authors, this was great. Screening for ocular findings among patients with candidemia. Isn't it time to change practice? This was a response to O'Donnell et al.'s perspective endorsing ocular screening for patients with candida septicemia. Um, screening for ocular candidiasis among patients with candidemia is a time to change practice. Um, that was recently published in CID. And I have to say, as I went through, I realized I was pretty much going to read the whole article. So a few really salient points. And I think mostly I'm going to read the whole article. Um, <laughs> I really like the word salient. I plan to use that more often in casual conversation. Yeah. <laughs> you make several salient points. Now on to the salient points, shall we? These authors comment that O'Donnell et al.'s perspective does not recognize the misattribution of nonspecific ocular findings to candidemia instead of underlying comorbidities. The authors state that ocular candidiasis found in approximately 20% of those with candidemia results from fungal infection. However, about 20% of critically ill patients, regardless of candidemia, will have ocular findings indistinguishable from those mentioned and are more likely due to anemia, hypertension, malignancy-related, or other comorbidities. Reported ocular findings are subjective, universally lacking histological, microbiological confirmation, and susceptible to confirmation bias, such as when an observer performs an examination in a specific disease setting, as in the case of, would you look at this patient's eye who has candidemia? In a systemic review, none among 7,500 screened had ocular tissue confirmation of fungus. Wow. Then it gets even better. So if you're driving, you might want to pull over so as not to distract you from the important <laughs> task of driving. We want you there to listen to future episodes. The authors continue with, Although ocular findings have led to altered extended courses, there is no evidence in current literature to support that changing management, systemic therapy provides benefit, and treatment-related safety data are lacking. Furthermore, prospective multi-center investigations have not shown drug class, dose, or dose duration modifications are either beneficial, including echinocandids thought to have inferior ocular penetration or should be based on ocular findings. Now, you really need to read this in sh this entire short and well-written piece. I've read most of it to you. But they conclude, and I am persuaded that, given the lack of specificity and a high prevalence of incidental findings noted during ocular screening, routine screenings is counterproductive and may lead to avoidable complications and unsupported changes in management and point out that the American Academy of Ophthalmology maintains the published recommendations. The Academy does not recommend a routine ophthalmological consultation after a laboratory findings of systemic candida septicemia. All right. That was great. Wasn't that, Sarah? Yeah, it was great. <laughs> Just the enthusiasm in the room has been lifted. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure why I liked it so much, but it was so well written. All right, the article. Now we're moving on to parasitic, and I want everyone to uh, listen to This Week in Parasitism. Yes, that uh, podcast that was mocked on NPR. Uh, yes, there are exciting things. Oh, I have not heard to. about this. <laughs> yes, I was driving my son to soccer and I heard there's this, you know, it's one of those, is this true or not? And, um, you know, 
where they, they said, there's this podcast called This Week in Parasitism. They talk about exciting developments in parasitism and present mystery cases. And they're like, yeah, we think that's that's not true. We, we're going to go with the podcast about buttons. All right. <laughs> Wow, I'm you know I'm just surprised they didn't call you out that it's not every week yeah. that it's released. <laughs> yes, and they call it this week in parasitism, but they only do it once a month. <laughs> not even weekly. <laughs> All right, the articles: effects of day-to-day variation of Opus thorcus viverini antigen in urine on the accuracy of diagnosing Opus thorciasis in Northeast Thailand was published in PLOS One. Um, actually, a buddy of mine, Johnny from Hawaii, who I met in Thailand, sent me a bunch of treats that all taste brought me back to Thailand, um, back to a great case of Opus thorcus viverini that we heard about while there. Um, I am a big fan of point of care diagnostics, and perhaps our listeners are all on board with how critical access to testing is after lessons not learned, apparently from COVID, and being demonstrated again with the monkeypox. We'll hear a subset of participants, 801 with matched fecal and urine samples were analyzed for comparison of interday prevalence estimates and the performance of the urine assay compared against formalin ethyl acetate concentration technique FECT for diagnosis of opus thorcus. Uh, maybe I'm also, I'd much rather take a little bit of urine and do a dipstick than have to concentrate feces. Overall, the good news, the urine assay had better diagnostic performance than fecal examination. The high sensitivity plus negligible daily variation of antigen urine indicates the utility of the urine assay for diagnosis as well as population screening. All right, and we're going to wrap it up with our last miscellaneous, the article Disposable versus Reuse Medical Gowns, a Performance Comparison, was published in the American Journal of Infection Control. Now, I have to say, I'm, I'm a little bit disturbed, but I do have to say that I look at some of these transparent tissue paper gowns, and I wonder what they're supposed to actually do. Should I feel safe? Um, my suspicion may be well-founded, according to this study. These researchers found that level one and level two disposable gowns did not meet AAMI performance specifications for impact penetration water resistance. All three levels of disposable gowns also failed to meet the American Society for Testing and Materials performance requirements for breaking strength in the cross-wide direction. They also suggested that the adoption of reusable gowns may result in increased protection and significant cost savings due to their superior durability and sustainability when compared to the disposable gowns. And Greta will thank you. <laughs> And that brings us to the end of this podcast. As always, the references for this show are available at microbe.tv, the home of our multimedia empire. You can find the Infectious Disease Puscast at Apple Podcasts. We love to get your questions, comments, paper suggestions. Keep sending them to puscast at microbe.tv and consider supporting the science shows of Microbe TV at microbe.tv forward slash contribute. I'm Sarah Dong. You can find me on Twitter at SWinDong or at Febrile Podcast or at FebrilePodcast.com. I'm Daniel Griffin, and you can find me at ParasitesWithoutBorders.com, on Twitter at Daniel Griffin MD, as well as on the other podcasts, This Week in Parasitism, put out once a month, This Week in <laughs> Virology Clinical Updates. Thanks for listening. We'll be back in two weeks. Another, Another podcast is, is infectious. infectious.